So I'm going to jump right in. We're at, we're at, we're at our, um, our final uh, closing keynote presentation. And I'm going to be introducing Frank Ostaseski. Uh, he is an internationally respected Buddhist teacher and visionary co-founder of the Zen Hospice Project and founder of the Meta Institute. He has lectured at Harvard Medical School, the Mayo Clinic, Google headquarters, and at major spiritual centers around the globe. He is the 2018 recipient of the prestigious Humanities Award from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Care, Palliative Medicine. His groundbreaking work has been featured on the Bill Moyers PBS series on our own terms, highlighted on the Oprah Winfrey show, and honored by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He is the author of The Five Invitations, Discovering What Death Can Teach Us About Living Fully, which you can get signed afterwards uh, if you haven't had it, uh, picked up a copy already. And please join me in welcoming a great thinker, Frank Ostaseski. Hi. Oh, hi. I know some of you. You know, our, uh, thank you. Our conference is uh, coming to an end, coming to a close, yeah? And dying folks taught me that when you come close to the end, you should slow down, yeah? And you know, at the end, it's, uh, it's not so technical. It's more relational. Yeah? So that's, that's what we have to do here. I was uh, just down the road here in Silicon Valley with a bunch of Silicon Valley mucky mucks a little while back. And I said uh, to them, death is inevitable. And the guy raised his hand right away. And he said, we're working on that. And I said, great. You know, when you get that licked, let me know, you know. I said, suppose we remove the word death from the sentence. And we just said, we just started talking about endings. Endings. If you want to know something about what death has to teach, look at the way you meet endings. You know, the ending of a meal, the ending of a day, the end of the exhale. How do you meet endings? I mean, most of us have some patterns, some habits around that, you know. And I don't have any moral judgments about how we're supposed to meet endings. I'm just curious to know, how do you meet them? How do you meet the end of a conference? I mean, do you go unconscious around endings? Do you leave either emotionally or mentally before the end is actually here? Like, are you already planning what's for dinner? Or are you the last one in the parking lot, you know, waving goodbye to everybody as they leave? Yeah. Or maybe endings cause you to feel sad or teary-eyed in some way. Or maybe anxious. Or some of us are totally indifferent to endings. And so we kind of isolate ourselves in some kind of protective cocoon. Like notice, a conference like this, do you stop talking to others just before the end comes? So you don't get something started that you can't finish? Huh. So without judgment, without any criticality, you might be curious just to look and see how you meet endings. What are your patterns? And are you happy? Are you satisfied with those habits? If not, you can change them. You don't have to continue them. You have a choice. So ask yourself a couple of questions, you know. If you really want to know what your relationship is to death, look at your relationship to endings. How do you normally meet endings? Like when you end a relationship, when you leave a party, how do you normally meet endings? Yeah, that's the first question. Second, you know, why do you think or feel you meet them that way? And third one, where did you learn to meet endings that way? 
Yeah. Who taught you that? You know, like my wife and I, we have a ritual that we do oftentimes before we go to sleep at night. We did it last night. We ask each other four questions to sort of make the day, the ending of the day, a conscious act. We ask ourselves, each other, what inspired you today? And that's a way of sort of looking and seeing what's the leading edge of your life. You know, what really is inspiring you? We ask that question. Then we ask each other, what challenged you today? You know, because, you know, we don't grow in our comfort zones, right? We grow on the edges, so to speak. So what challenged you today? And then we ask each other, what surprised you today? Surprise is a good one. Surprise uh, lets you know where you're hanging on too tightly. Yeah? Like, I can play peekaboo with my granddaughter 10,000 times. Every time she's surprised. Every time. <laughs> Without fail. Yeah? Now, you throw an adult a surprise party, and most of somebody will say, who's responsible for this? Yeah? Yeah. So surprise helps us to know where we might be holding on a little too tightly. And then we ask each other, what did you learn about love today? What did you learn about love today? Those four questions, by the way, come from an old dear friend of mine, Angelus Arian, who died a few years ago, a member of my faculty, dear friend. Now, as we sort of think about endings here and today, I want to just share with you a couple of things. One is that I've sat on the bedside with a couple of thousand people over the last three or four decades. And one of the things they taught me was don't wait. Don't wait. I mean, to imagine at the time of your dying that you're going to have the physical strength, the emotional stability, the mental clarity to do the work of a lifetime is a kind of ridiculous gamble. Yeah? I don't advise you to take that bet. Don't wait. Dying folks taught me that. I was, one day I was at the hospice and I was washing the back of one of our patients, Joe, and as I was washing his back, he turned over his shoulder and he said to me, Frank, I never thought it would be like this. And I said, well, what did you think? I said, what? And he said, dying. And I said, what did you think it would be like? And he said, I never thought about it. And you see, in that moment, that was a greater cause of his suffering than his terminal lung cancer. He'd been caught by surprise by death, you see? And by the way, just because we work in hospice or palliative care, don't assume that inoculates you from being taken by surprise. It's the elephant in the room, right? The truth we all know that we also agree not to talk about, that we project our worst fears onto, that we use euphemisms to discuss, that we sidestep when possible or avoid the conversation altogether. Well, we can run, but we cannot hide. You know the old Babylonian story about the, the merchant who sends his servant, they call him a servant in the story, to go to the market, they buy the household goods. And he goes to the market, and while he's shopping for avocados and asparagus, he bumps into a woman, and he turns, and he realizes that she's deaf. And he becomes terrified. And he runs home, and he says to the merchant, lend me your horse. At the, at the market, I ran into death, and she made this threatening glance at me. And I know she's coming to get me. Give me your horse, and I will ride to Samara tonight, and there death will not find me. And of course... He rides off on his horse, magically arrives in Samara from Baghdad. And the merchant goes to the market, and he too encounters death. And he says to death, what was that? Why, you scared my servant today. Why'd you do that? That was a terrible thing to do. You made that threatening glance at my servant. And death said, oh no, that wasn't a threatening glance. That was a look of astonishment, of surprise. I was surprised to see him here in Baghdad this morning. I knew I had an appointment with him tonight in Samara. Yeah, we can run, but we cannot hide. Over the last 30 or so years, I've sat on the precipice of death with a lot of folks, and some of those folks came to their death full of disappointment, and others blossomed and opened and found the forgiveness and the kindness and the love that they'd wanted their whole life, you know. 
and others they turned toward the wall in hopelessness and withdrawal and depression and they never came back again. All of them were my teachers. And it seems to me that the ones that really were able to turn toward their experience were the people who were willing to live into the deeper dimensions of what it means to be human. Yeah? So today, I don't have any PowerPoint slides, I'm sorry. I cannot tell you how to solve the opioid crisis, nor how to work with the joint commissions. But what I would like to do is to invite death into the room. Not that we haven't been talking about it, it's easy to talk about it, but to invite it into the room is something different. To sit down with it, have a cup of tea, get to know it really well, you know? I think we can learn a lot about living fully by getting comfortable sitting with death. That's the secret teacher hiding in plain sight. And she shows us really what matters most. And the really good news is that we don't have to wait until the end of our lives to learn the wisdom that death has to teach us. You know, in Zen we say, um, when your teachers are in the room, it keeps you honest. So I, I brought my teachers with me. In just a moment, I'm going to ask them to show photos of them on the screen. But these are real people, not my deck. You know, these are people who are really trying their very best um, to teach us about what they've encountered. And so in just a moment, we'll put them up on the screen. But before we do that, our tendency when we look at screens is to look at them in a kind of passive way, you know? We're not really there for it. And so I'd like to encourage us, partly because we're at the end here, partly because it's important that we go slower, that we get more relational, to just put down whatever you're holding on to, whether it's your pens or computers or coffee cups or your ideas. Yeah? Set them all down for a moment. If you feel comfortable, put both your feet on the floor. And if it seems all right to you, you can let your eyes close or let them be open slightly. A few intentional breaths is always helpful. And then open all the doors and windows of your senses. The sense of smell, of taste, of touch, of hearing and seeing. The doors of perception. And then, if, if you can, just let your attention come for a moment to the experience of hearing. Not the idea of it, but the direct experience. Where are the sound of my voice? The other sounds in the room? Those outside the room? You see that sounds emerge and they're known and then they change or pass away. And if you listen a little more closely, which is really what our work is at the end of life, then you hear the silence. And the silence is really undisturbed. Sounds come and go, the silence itself undisturbed. See if you can get a sense of that silence yourself. How big is it? Is it just in your head? Is it just at your table? Is it just in the room? How much space is there? Are there any boundaries to the silence? Sounds come and go in that space just as sensations do just as feelings and emotions do, just as thoughts come and go. So in just a moment, staying in this very state of mind that you find yourself in, state of body and heart that you find yourself in, 
I'm going to ask you to look at the photos. Now, as you look at the photos, keep sensing your body, keep feeling your heart, keep observing your mind. There's nothing more important. You'll learn much more from that than you will listening to me. And then when you look at the photos, I want you to notice what attracts you and what causes you to pull away, even if only slightly. It's really important to see both of those. What attracts you and what causes you to pull away. And we'll talk about this afterwards, so it's really important that you track that moment to moment. So I'm going to ask the text, our friends, Ellen to, uh, Kelly rather, to start the uh, slides and you can open your eyes. So these people are going to teach and I'm going to translate. Okay? Some of these folks, some of the people I worked with, they lived in terrible conditions. In rat infested hotels. I changed a lot of diapers on park benches behind City Hall in San Francisco. And they were alcoholics and prostitutes and homeless folks who barely survived on the margins of society. They didn't trust much. They often wore the face of resignation when they were angry about their loss of control. Many of them had lost all confidence in humanity. Some of them were from cultures I didn't know, speaking languages I couldn't understand. Nguyen, and I remember a wonderful Vietnamese guy, he stayed with us, he was very scared of ghosts. And his roommate, Isaiah, African-American man, he was very comforted by nightly visits from his dead mother. <laughs> These two were quite a pair. There was a man I worked with, he was a hemophiliac and he had contracted uh, the HIV virus from a blood transfusion. But the year before, he had disowned his gay son when his son told him that he was HIV positive. And now father and son were in twin beds in the same room on Bernal Heights, you know, being cared for by Agnes, the son's mother and the father's wife. For some of these folks, you know, dying was a great gift. They found that kindness and acceptance that I spoke of earlier. But not everybody did. You know, I'm not romantic about dying. I think it's the hardest work we may ever do. And sometimes it's beautiful and sometimes it's horrible and sometimes it's messy and Sometimes it's transformative, but most of all, it's ordinary. We all go through this. Nobody gets out of here alive. I mean, maybe today, but I don't even guarantee that. Yeah. And you know, the habits of our life, they have a very strong momentum that propel us right into our dying process. So the question that arises for me all the time is, what habits do I want to create? Suppose we stop compartmentalizing death, cutting it off from life. Imagine if we regarded death as the final stage of growth, an opportunity for transformation. Then might we turn to this experience and say, how then shall we live? I think without a reminder of death, we get caught up. You know, we get swept up in endless pursuits of self-gratification. I want to keep death really close. And I really want to speak to your hearts here. Not, in, not your role. I want to speak to your hearts. When you keep death really close, really at your fingertips, you know, then I think we don't hold on so tightly. We don't take ourselves so seriously. We don't hold our beliefs so firmly. We let go a little more easily. And we recognize that death comes to everybody. And when we know that, we get it that we're all in a boat together. And the way in which we take care of each other is fundamentally different. In this culture still, even in conferences like today, we still regard death as a medical event. And while it's important that we bring the best of what medicine has to offer, 
I don't think the medical model, as brilliant as it is, is large enough to contain the profundity of what happens in the dying process. Death is too big for any model. And when we speak about just making the best of a bad situation, we rob death of its holy significance. And I think the dying experience can offer us much more than that. Death is inevitable and intimate. And ordinary people, people like you and me, regularly come to the end of their lives and emerge as something larger than the small separate self they've taken themselves to be. It's not a fairy tale ending. It regularly occurs for lots of people in the final months, days, weeks, sometimes minutes of life. Too late, you might say, and I would agree. It's too late to do it in the final moments of life, but here's the thing. If that opportunity exists then, will it exist now? And we don't have to wait until then. And we don't have to tell people that that's when it's going to happen. It can happen now. We can harness the awareness of death to appreciate the fact that we're alive, to encourage self-exploration, to, to clarify our values. You know, what becomes so clear, right, when we're sitting at the bedside of someone who's dying is that fragility and impermanence are in the very nature of life. It's always coming together and falling apart and not just the time of death. And we can hold it all with love and compassion. I think when we come into contact with just how precarious this life is and we let that into our bones, not just into our charts, I think that we understand just how precious it is then. And then we don't want to waste a minute, you know? So I think don't wait. That's the things people have told me. Don't wait is a, is a kind of pathway to fulfillment, uh, an antidote to regret. Instead of pinning our hopes on a better future, we focus on the present and we're grateful for what's in front of us. How many of you think death will come later? <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, that word later gives us this comfortable buffer between now and our death. It's going to come later. Well, constant change is not later. It's now. Impermanence is the essential truth woven into the very fabric of our existence. It's perfectly normal and our most constant companion. I mean, could someone please tell me, where is this morning's breakfast? Yeah. Where is last night's lovemaking? Someone, please tell me, where has my blonde hair gone? <laughs> yeah. It seems like it was here just a moment ago. You know, we understand, every one of us here, that one day our mother's treasured vase that we have protected for years and we've kept on that special mantelpiece, one day that's going to fall off the shelf and break. And our car's going to break down and people we love are going to die. Our work, I think, is to is to move that understanding from our intellects and nestle it deep in our hearts. Impermanence isn't the cause of our suffering. We rely on change. We rely on impermanence. I mean, that cold you have today, it's not going to last forever. That really boring dinner party you're going to go to on Saturday night, it will eventually come to an end. Presidential terms end. <laughs> impermanence is humbling, isn't it? I mean, it's absolutely certain, and yet the way in which it will manifest is completely unpredictable. It's funny, you know, we all pretty much agree that life is constant flux, right? Constant change. Relationships come and go, seasons come and go. Everything changes except me. I'm the one thing moving through life that doesn't change. I mean, sometimes I, I see friends I haven't seen for a while, and they say, oh, Frank, it's great to see you. You haven't changed a bit, and I'm really insulted, you know? <laughs> we are nothing but constant change. 
and yet we pull ourselves out of the stream of change, out of the stream of impermanence, and we wonder why we feel separate. We are not the social worker, we are not the nurse, we are not the administrator, we're not even the person listening to this talk, at least not in the way that we imagined. We're flux. We are at once here and disappearing. You know, last year, in this very week, I was in Japan teaching. And while I was there, it was cherry blossom season, the height of cherry blossom season. And they're beautiful, delicate blossoms that last for one week. And the Japanese chase them all over Japan. It's beautiful. I, I teach up in Idaho and on the border of Canada. And I stay in this little cabin, and outside the cabin where I teach, there are these little tiny blue flax flowers that last for a single day. Single day. Tell me, why are those flowers so much more magnificent than plastic ones? I mean, plastic ones last forever, right? I mean, isn't it the fragility, their fragility, the brevity of their lives that invites us into wonder and gratitude? Death is not a stranger. It's always announcing itself, and not just on an admission day, you know? This moment of your life you're living now, it's never going to come again. And you don't know how many more moments you'll have, and no matter how much you accomplish and how many times you do something, there's going to come a time when you do it for the last time. So you have this one opportunity to fall in love with life. Why not relax? With all of its difficulties, relax into life. You know, I had a... I was teaching a retreat for doctors and nurses on compassion, and in the middle of it, I had a heart attack. Yeah. I denied it three times, like Peter denied Christ, you know. <laughs> it's true. Anyway, it resulted in triple bypass surgery. Big deal, you know, they crack open your chest and pull it apart. And it's pretty invasive. And everything, every, all the ways I thought of myself got challenged. And I felt depressed and helpless and didn't think I'd be able to do my work anymore. Recovery took many months, you know, and then I had to go back in. The, the grafts had failed. I had to go back and do it all over again. And um, while I was recovering, a very famous Tibetan teacher, I won't say who, he called me up, and this particular teacher had had trouble with his heart, and so I thought, he's going to know how to help me to do this. He's going to help me do this. He's going to show me, give me some esoteric practice that will tell me, how do I step through this madness, the beauty, the horror of it all? And I said, how'd you do it? And he said, after a long pause, I think it's good to have a heart. <laughs> and he said, if you have a heart, well, you should expect it will have problems. And then he told me to rest, and he hung up. That was it. No esoteric practice. No great solution. But afterwards, I thought, you know, he's right, you know. If we have a heart, if we have a human body, we should expect that we'll have problems. I mean, who told us otherwise? We can make those signs that say, call it a line with, with the word pain and a line going through it, but that doesn't mean it's going to take away all suffering. Hmm. You know, there's this phenomenon that we encounter oftentimes when we're working with people with cancer, um, particularly after the initial shock of the diagnosis is, is passed. A friend of mine called it a secret gratitude. Secret gratitude. Because the illness has given them perspective. And they say things like, now I can say no to more work. Or to boring dinner parties. Or before I always felt I was obliged to say yes. But now I, I can finally rest. And a woman that 
we took care of at the hospice, she was this really tough 86-year-old Russian Jewish lady. She was tough as nails, the kind of person I like working with. And the night she was dying, they called me, and I went into her room, as I always did when patients were dying. And I found my way into the room, and I, I sat in the corner. That's my way. I don't go right up and sit at the bedside, because I want to sit there and see, is anything really needed before I jump in to help? There on the bed was Adele, you know, with her feet sort of dangling off the bed and in her nightdress. And a really great home attendant, uh, home health aide was with her. And um, while I was sitting there, I was watching Adele breathe with great difficulty. Every in-breath a struggle, every out-breath a struggle. And this despite all the correct interventions. All the right oxygen and morphine was on board. But there's a labor to dying, just like there's a labor to getting born. It's not wrong. And Pat turned to her and she said, Adele, you don't have to be frightened. I'm right here with you. And Adele looked at her and she said, Honey, if this was happening to you, you'd be frightened. <laughs> so I stayed in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. And a little while later, uh, Pat said to her, you look a little cold. Would you like a blanket or a shawl around your shoulders? And Adele said, of course I'm cold. I'm almost dead. <laughs> I mean, I hope I have half of the tenacity of this woman, you know, when I'm dying. So I noticed two things. One is I noticed that she didn't want any nonsense. She didn't want to talk about tunnels of light. She wanted real relationship, authentic, real person sitting there. And the other was that there was struggle. There was a labor. And in this case, the labor was manifesting in the breath. So I pulled up my chair close to her, and we'd known each other for a few months, so I could be pretty straight with her. And I said, Adele, would you like to struggle a little less? And she said, yes. And I said, okay. I noticed there, right at the end of the exhale, there was this little pause just before the next inhale. I wonder if you could put your attention there for a moment. Now, this is an 86-year-old Russian Jewish lady who's come off the streets. She doesn't care beans about Buddhism or meditation or any of these things. But she's highly motivated in this moment to be free of suffering. And that's what gets most people to turn toward an inner life. So I said, I'll do it with you, come on. So she would breathe in, I would breathe in, and she would breathe out, I would breathe out. I didn't teach her how to breathe, I didn't guide her. We just were breathing together. Once in a while I'd remind her about the gap. And as she, you could see her attention come there. And as it did, you could see the fear that had characterized her face just drain away. And after a while she said, Frank, I'm going to rest now. And I said, good idea. And she laid back on her pillow, and a little while later, she died very peacefully. Do we have to die before we can rest in peace? What are we waiting for? I think when we embrace impermanence, first it scares the hell out of us. And then it becomes a liberating opportunity. I think we can treasure experiences we can feel deeply, all without clinging. And we're free to savor life and to taste the texture of every passing moment. Whether that's a moment of sadness or of joy. You know, when I had my heart attacks, uh, I... Um, I studied the work of famous people who had had heart attacks. And I looked at what they, how they went through it to get some guidance. And Abe Maslow was one of the people I studied. And Abe, when he had his heart attack, he, he wrote something beautiful. He said, death and its ever-present ever possibility makes love, passionate love, more possible. Are we remembering that when we go into the room where someone's dying? Or are we so busy trying to get our chart right. You know the two most important questions that people ask me when they're dying? It's not about the five great regrets. 
I mean, they talk about that, but the two questions that people ask me regularly or inquire about in themselves are, am I loved? And did I love well? Now, if those are the two most important questions at the end of our life, aren't they the most important questions now? And why wait? Why wait to answer those, to live into those? All our relationships will end in separation. That's the great gift of doing this work, is that we get taught that. People we love will die. The question is, how do we want to care for them now? How do we want to attend to our relationships now? Don't wait. Dying folks taught me that. You know, to be human in this life, at least for me, is more than getting born and getting a good education and a good job and the right partner and going to work and coming back home and going to sleep so you can wake up and do it all over again in the morning. It's an invitation to feel everything. And if dying folks have taught me anything, it's that. To feel everything. To come into direct contact with this strange and beautiful and horrible and sometimes perfectly ordinary thing we call life. It's an opportunity to be conscious of the fact that some of us will make love while others make war. To recognize the truth that there are babies like my granddaughter whose mother kisses a bright future into her cheek every morning. And there are babies like my friend Carolyn whose mother left her in a dumpster when she was born. is to understand that there's children being shot in our schools and there are others who are speaking truth to power. That there are kids tonight crying themselves to sleep in Syrian refugee camps and there are other kids here who are making tents out of couch pillows and bed sheets yeah, in living rooms. There's devastation, there's hopelessness and there's the passion and holy commitment to create a better life for everyone. There's me speaking and you listening and the separation between us and there's the unity we feel almost immediately when we speak of love. Don't wait. Dying folks taught me that. There's a lot of... Um, talk about compassion in our world and in the world at large. And it's good that we speak about it. It's best that we enact it. Um, you know, in my tradition, uh, there are two uh, aspects to compassion. Wisdom and compassion, they go together. Yeah, Wisdom and compassion. Attempts at wisdom without any compassion, well, they get a little heady. And attempts at compassion without any wisdom, well, they get a little sentimental and mushy. Yeah? So you bring them together. Uh, when I was introduced, he was talking about meeting His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And when you meet the Dalai Lama, it's a big deal. So I, when I met him, you bow traditionally to your teacher. And generally, you try to bow lower than your teacher. Except I'm much taller than the Dalai Lama. <laughs> so when I bowed, he bowed lower. So I bowed still lower, and I looked up and he bowed lower. So I bowed as low as I possibly could, hoping he wouldn't go any lower, and I looked up to see if he was going to bow lower. And then he just wrapped his arms around me and laughed at me. <laughs> I was taking myself far too seriously. And I think in this work, it's easy to do that. You know, in my tradition, there's a character, uh, she's, it's called a bodhisattva, a great saint or sage. And the name is Avalokiteshvara, and Avalokiteshvara has 1,000 arms. And depending on the depiction, depiction rather, Avalokiteshvara has either an eye in one his hand, in each of those hands, to see the suffering of the world, or an ear to hear the cries of the world. Yeah? And 1,000 arms to respond. Yeah? You've, you've seen her and cost plus or something, yeah. <laughs> the 
my friend Bernie Glassman, who died a few months back, he, uh, he was teaching in Germany once about this very subject of Avalokiteshwar and compassion, and he talked about this 1,000 armed figure, and the man in the audience raised his hand, and he said, that's a beautiful metaphor, but I only have two arms. What should I do? And Bernie, who was very bright and kind, he said, I'm sorry, sir, you're mistaken. The man looked. He said, no, I just have two arms. And then Bernie did something really simple. He had everybody in the audience raise both their arms. Go ahead, do it. Look around. Look around. You see? We are Avalokiteshvara. We are the thousand arms. Do you see? No one else is coming to the rescue. We're it. And when we understand that, we don't have to carry it all on our shoulders anymore. We can know that we do the best we can and then let go. And then somebody else will come along some other pair of arms, yeah? Please try to remember that, yeah? Thank you very much. Okay, sit down. All right, I promised... Um, I promised Kristen and the gang that's put this program together that we try and do something experiential. And uh, where's Nate? Nate, are you here? Okay, so Nate's back there. He's the reason I'm here. Yeah. Uh, so if you're, say thanks to him. Uh, I'm very loyal to the people who study with me. And Nate studied with me and he was a volunteer at Zen Hospice many years ago. And, so when he asked me to come to this, I said yes, because... Because I'm loyal to my students. You've been looking at the photos, yeah? What attracted you? What caused you to pull away, even if only slightly? It's important to know that. What attracted you? What caused you to pull away? So at your tables, just as you are, this is the experiential part. I just want you to take a moment, each of you, to say what attracted you and what caused you to pull away. Without a big story, it doesn't need a story. It just needs that. You know, maybe it was one photo. Maybe it was the same photo that attracted you and caused you to pull away. I don't know. Don't be afraid to say the part that caused you to pull away. That's important to acknowledge, okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do this just for five or seven minutes at your table, just to give each person a chance to speak. And not just a laundry list. Say, this is what attracted me and why. And this is what caused me to pull away and why. And then let the other person speak, okay? So that not a lot of crosstalk. Just we'll take a few minutes just to do that. And then we'll see what we can learn from the group at large, okay? So if you do that right now, I'll wait for you, okay? Go ahead. What attracted you? What caused you to pull away? Even if only slightly. Talk to each other. <sighs> Kelly, can you put Sono up? Oh, no, actually, wait. When I come back.
Okay, just take a few more minutes, maybe one or two more minutes. Make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Okay. Okay, let's come back. Sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry if we didn't get every, give everybody a chance to speak. My, my, I take that responsibility. Um, but I have to be mindful of our time. You know how we are with endings. We always mark that time that it ended. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have time for everybody to come up to microphones and stuff, so we're going to use our... Shakespearean training and shout it out. What attracted you? What caused you to pull away? Somebody willing to say? Come on. Connected eyes were what? What attracted you? That's what attracted you. What caused you to pull away? Michael. Constractions and contextual isolation like hospital environments, for example. Yeah, okay. The humanity. Yeah. Yeah. The humanity in all those faces. And what was it that caused you to pull away? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Great. Somebody else over here at this side of the room. Yes, way in the back. Go ahead. Oh, this woman. Uh-huh, okay, all right. The woman with a fist, that was hard for you, for some people, strength represents strength for others. Okay, what else? Come on. Cigarettes. Cigarettes were attractive or caused you to pull away? Come on, you're, you're in Northern California. Yeah, no, no. You, you, remember, these, some of these pictures are a, few, are a little dated, but you could smoke in your beds at Laguna Honda Hospital. Now, there came a time when that was not appropriate anymore, so we had to create a smoker's room. And then I put up pictures of famous dead smokers in the room. <laughs> Marlena Dietrich, Humphrey Bogart, etc. But all the Buddhists who were closet smokers, they would go in that room, you know, finally came out. Yeah, for some people, same thing. It's like, oh, that's horrible. Other people, oh, I'm really glad that they had the freedom to do that. Who do we to get to judge what people should do? All right, what else? Yeah. Ah, okay. So I like the sense of connection through the eyes. The feeling of loneliness was difficult for me. Okay, here's the thing. Do all of you know what tarot cards are? Okay, so you don't have to believe in tarot. But you know what tarot cards are? They're archetypical images of the human condition. That's what they are. And so on tarot cards, you see the whole human condition. I think these are like tarot cards. I think the whole human condition is here. Now, here's the thing. I know these folks. I cared for most of them. I could tell you their backstory. You don't know them, so what are you seeing? You're right. We're seeing our own hopes and fears. This is what I want, this is what I don't want. I want connection, I don't want loneliness. I want eyes of the soul to look at me, but I don't want all that contextual stuff. Yeah? When we see ourselves and the people we serve, and we see them in us, the way in which we care for them is fundamentally different. And I'm not speaking here about some kind of merge, transference, you know, entanglement. I'm speaking about seeing our common humanity in each other. And it's important that you see your mother in them, that you see your grandmother in them. You will care for them differently. Yeah? Hey, 
Carrie, Kelly, put up the, those other photos, would you? Anybody else want to shout out something? The, ba the babies. Who said the babies? Yeah, what about them? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, bringing babies in and this juxtaposition of life ending and life beginning. You know, in our hospice, that one of the things we had was we used to have a program for kids, homeless kids, in the downstairs of our hospice so that that sound of laughter came up through the floorboards. And also we gave a place where people needed a place to stay. They could, they could be there. Who's the back table? Remember the one with the fist? Yeah. Her, her name is Sono, S-O-N-O, -O, Sono. She's lived on the margins of society. Next slide. Oh, I have the clicker, don't I? Yeah, hang on. Sorry. Same woman. How do you get from that to that? That picture's taken two hours after she came into our hospice. That picture's taken two hours after she died. Well, wait. How do you move, how do you move from that to that. I think you give people an opportunity to reflect on their lives, not just to answer your questions. You give them a chance to think about what has meaning and purpose in their life, what the value of their life has been. You let them articulate and tell their st things. They're not just, you know, where they were born. You know, life review is a really important part, I think, of our work, but I sometimes think it's too linear. You ask counterintuitive questions. Ask What's the one thing you wish you could remember about your mother? And someone says, oh, it was her smell. Oh, I wish I could remember the smell of her. You let people reflect, write, tell their story, get it down. And you offer compassionate companionship, right? Whatever face that takes. And it doesn't always matter who's providing it. Who is that person? with her. Who's that person with her? Is she a doctor? Is she a volunteer? Is she a nurse? Anybody know? I do. How do you get from there to there? You see that piece of paper somebody asked about it? That, uh, I was in the kitchen one day reading a book of Japanese death poems. That's a tradition in Japan. Monks, Zen monks and nuns write a death poem on the day of their death that tells the essential truth of their life. Now, if you don't die that day, it doesn't count. You have to write a new one the next day. <laughs> so I was reading this book of death poems, and Sono said to me, what's that? And I told her, and she said, I want to write one of those. I said, you should definitely do it. Good idea. What's the form, she said. I said, oh, don't worry about the form. Just write it. So she went upstairs to her room. And about three, hour later, three hours later, she summoned me. Didn't ask for me. She summoned me. And I got to her room, and she said, Frank, I've written my death poem. And when I die, I want you to pin it to my clothes, and I want to be cremated with it. And I said, Sona, I promise you I will do that. Thank you. And she said, but before that, I want you to learn it by heart. Now, words are important when people are dying. She didn't say memorize it. She said learn it by heart. She said, I want to know if that poem lives in someone else's soul. I said, okay. And she taught it to me. And I repeated it many times until she was certain that it was in my bones. You want to hear a poem? She says, uh, by the way, this is a woman living on the margins of society. You know, the people we pass by on the streets all the time who ask for a buck? She said, she writes, don't just stand there with your hair turning gray. Soon enough, the seas will sink your little island. So while there is still the illusion of time set out for some other shore, no sense packing a bag you won't be able to lift it into your boat. So give away all of your collections. Take only new seeds and an old stick. 
Send out some prayers on the wind before you sail. Don't be afraid. Someone knows you're coming. An extra fish has been salted. Don't just stand there with your hair turning gray. Soon enough, the seas will sink your little island. So while there's still the illusion of time, that's a great line, set out for some other shore. In other words, practice now. Have the conversation now. No sense packing your bag. You won't be able to lift it into your boat. Is it the second Mercedes that matters more? Or am I loved? Does that matter more? Give away all of your collections. Take only new seeds and an old stick. You know how farmers and gardeners used to work? Hole in the ground with a stick, drop in a seed, cover it up with your dirt. Stick in the ground, hole, drop in a seed. This is a woman who understands that death is not a full stop, at least not in her belief system. Send out some prayers on the wind before you sail. In other words, don't think you can do this alone. This myth that people die alone, stop, let's stop telling each other that. Let's, get e let's help each other. Don't be afraid. Someone knows you're coming. An extra fish has been salted. Thank you, Sono. Thank you all very much.